Welcome to the wide world of esports, a show devoted to all things esports. I'm your host, Catherine Knorr. Today, we're talking about China's policies on gaming. And my guest is Brendan Bussman, partner and director of government affairs at Global Market Advisors. Welcome, Brendan. Thank you. Pleasure to be with you today. So, what does Global Market Advisors do? So we are a uh, consulting firm that specializes in the gaming, entertainment, sports, and hospitality sectors. Uh, and we've done work all around the globe. Uh, other than probably Antarctica is probably the only uh, continent we haven't done anything on, um, but host of different projects uh, around the globe. Uh, obviously that's con curtailed a little bit by this wonderful thing called the pandemic, uh, but look to uh, you know reignite some of those relationships uh, and especially those in Asia, uh, hopefully in 2022, when I can get back to traveling. All right. So tell us about China's new policies on gaming. Well, you know, the Chinese have always had, uh, you know, a host of different policies, both on, on and I'm going to say this in two aspects, gaming and gambling, uh, even though they're symbiotic in how they view um, the, the overall nature and its, um, I'll use the word detriment, uh, to their society and, and causes an imbalance in the harmony um, that they suggest uh, and strive for. Um, probably two months ago, uh, they've started to curtail their uh, policy or craft it, I think, a little bit tighter. Um, when first and foremost, they came out and said, as it relates to video gaming, um, that they were going to limit the ability um, for um, youth um, and really sort of anybody in that uh, to make sure they can only do it during certain hours of the day uh, and only during certain times of the week um, and basically said hey um, you can do stuff on weekends and holidays uh, but the rest of it you know you're you're curtailed other than uh, you know a, a limited time out there um, and it also then goes to and this has been one of the questions that has remained out there um, which is, um, you know, what does this mean for game titles, uh, control and aspects of, of various games along the way, um, and how that may or may not, um, you know, uh, uh, curtail uh, future development of these uh, online games and, and everything else and ch children and teenagers uh, as they play these uh, in the limited one hour they have on on uh, on weekends and holiday evenings. Now, I would think that China is proud of their esports um, culture and that they've their and their esports business. I mean, they've actually built huge arenas for esports. So, how can they actually uh, continue to have esports um, competitions and athletes? if they limit um, the players' time playing? You know, that's a very good question. One that, um, you know, I, I sort of relate it to how they, how they view gambling um, a little bit off of this as well, which is, you know, it's a mainstream portion of the, of the income in places like Macau um, and the ability to, you know, reinvest in, in the social network down there. Um, but then they take very distinct views as it makes it towards uh, specifics to the general population to curtail these types of behaviors. Um, you know, I think it's anybody's guess on how this completely shakes out over the course of time. Um, but, you know, I think what they will probably end up doing is if they believe there is some individual that has a special talent uh, with one of these games or overall within the esports realm of this, uh, they'll sort of segment them off and say, okay, we'll let you go above and beyond, you know, but for the general public, we're putting these procedures in place. So um, very much of a, a, of a controlled society type feel that one, you know, here in the United States, we're not used to off of that, not just from the parameters of only allowing, uh, you know, kids to, to uh, partake in this for an hour uh, out of their day, but, but, you know, segmenting off and saying, hey, you have a talent, we'll let you sort of uh, step out of the fray and, and do these types of things. Sure. And I think that China has consistently done that with other with traditional sports. And uh, because I think when they identify um, talented children who are good at gymnastics or at uh, other 
sports, they do that same thing, especially when um, there, it's an Olympic sport. Do you think that if esports becomes an Olympic sport, that that will impact their policies? I, I think it would have to. Um, I think you can see, you know, looking at, um, you know, the, the latest Summer Olympics that was obviously a later, a, a year later, uh, than was originally scheduled. And obviously with the upcoming Winter Olympics, they're hosting uh, in Beijing here in three, four months, three months, I guess it is. Um, you know, they always strive to be the best in these and continue to, to be excellent uh, in every and all categories. So if esports were to become an Olympic sport, uh, and obviously I know there were some discussions off of that as it related to Japan that just got done hosting the Summer Olympics, uh, you know, a few months ago, um, I could see them wanting to and desiring to be the best in those and striving to do that and treating those just as you mentioned, like any other athlete out there, um, whether it's, you know, gymnastics, uh, you know, or any other event. Sure. And what, what do you think is behind the policy to restrict gaming hours? You know, I think it, there's a couple things that come to mind. Um, you know, the, the one thing that, that continually um gets swayed in, in the public eye off of this is is the social harmony and the social balances they strive within society um and making sure that you one don't overindulge in things keep things specific to what they believe uh they being um you know xi jinping and 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 his um, um realm that he has created and, and society that he desires uh, as he continues to take more and more power within uh, China um, for an ideal society. Um, and I think they look at things that can be distractions that could take hours upon hours uh, for general public, uh, no different than they do in other things, uh, as a distraction and a disruption to that harmony. So they're all about creating that balance along the way. Um, and that's why they put policies like this into place. Do you think the pandemic fueled this? Because I would think that as kids were spending more time at home, they were gaming more, and that probably came to the attention of government. I'm sure there, I mean, there's a host of different things. And, and you know, you go back, as we were talking before the show started, how much things have changed over two years. Um, and and policy-wise, um, and being able to do that, that, you know, one, I think it was an opportunity to say, okay, what's really going on here? Because we can now focus on certain areas to say, are people gaming more? Are they doing X? Are they doing Y along the way to see what really is happening off of that? Um, the other is because you've been able to curtail a lot of these behaviors. And, you know, as it relates to the pandemic and their zero tolerance policy, um, you're able to, you know, put people and say, look, you've got to stay at home. You've got to stay focused off of this um, so we can eliminate the, the, the virus. Um, but that allowed them to put in other procedures into place that allows them to dictate policies like this to say, look, we think our people are playing too much in video games and esports, and we don't want to see that happen. So this gives us an opportunity to do that. Uh, because we have everybody sort of corralled and, and focused off of this, and it's an opportunity to implement these policies uh, that you maybe would have had a harder and a more challenging time to do had that been in a normal everyday society that's running hustle bustle along the way. Sure. And across all over the world, esports and gaming are used in education. Uh, for example, Minecraft is used extensively, and in colleges, they have esports programs, they even have such programs in scholastic and, and you know, um, at, at different levels. And they use gaming to teach um, students. And then there's also um, col college scholarships for esports. So do they do that in China? And would that be impacted by the policy? You know, I think I think it could. Um, well, let me say two things. One, yes, yes, they do use those things to differentiate. It is a, it, it has been used in, in some aspects of a teaching tool, uh, probably not as much to as extent as you see here with some of the things that going on in the United States um, with, you know, the various clubs, science, science activities, 
uh, the college scholarships and that. But I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier of if we believe a student can excel in this, that we will segment them off and put them into a different track. No different than you would a normal athlete, no different than, you know, someone even scholastically you would say to say, hey, here's somebody that has a deep passion and interest in chemistry uh, and they seem to be doing leaps and bounds above everything else let's put them on a fast track to figure out some other thing that we need in that aspect. Um, so it's very much um, to your point, and back, back to the root of your question, um, I think some of those things have probably been curtailed um, because it's not like, hey, go home and do your homework on Minecraft because it, it's a school tool. Um, more, hey, we'll, we'll use it as we need to within the classroom. If you excel, we'll take you off and put you on a separate track so we're playing that. But uh, using that as an overall education tool uh, isn't the way we, you and I would view at it here in the United States. So how can a Chinese government even enforce this? Can't um, kids go home and play on their phone or play on a console? You know, I, I think there's probably some opportunities to go around that just as there is with everything in, in society uh, and to be able to do that. Um, obviously, I haven't had... Uh, you know, from my 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 uh, daily activities, we always like to do site visits and actually witness people doing stuff. Um, I, I haven't, as as we talked earlier, I haven't been uh, to Macau or Hong Kong um, since uh, you know fall of fall of nineteen. Um, and uh, the sad thing is, I had a full trip in China planned right before the pandemic hit, um, and, or right as the pandemic was hitting. So unfortunately, that trip got canceled. Uh, to be able to see that, but it'd be one that I'd love to be able to see what actually goes on and how do they or don't they um, get around that, you know, as it relates to other things that I've seen that I have witnessed in society with, as it relates to this, um, you can look at, at, at online gambling uh, that has been, uh, you know, something that mainland has found a way in some aspects to get around, um, but that has even been cur curtailed during the pandemic. Um, you know, you look at pre-pandemic levels of online gaming and the rate that they were, um, you know, attracting Chinese customers, it was very high because they were figuring out ways to move money in and out of the country. Now, that said, they've been able to limit that because uh, central government has come in and tried to put various uh, curtailing aspects of being able to transfer money and put other tracking mechanisms in, which I'm sure they're, they've done off of these things as it relates to, to esports and gaming to verify that X, Y, and Z. Um, the other thing is just from a societal perspective, um, you know, it, it is very much wanting to be, you know, overall, um, at least on mainland, um, you know, in, in that good faith. Uh, of what the what the government seeks, um, so you don't see um, you know a lot of rabble rousers like you would probably see here in the United States that you know would say eh screw it I'll pull the plug I'll play on my own and call it a day um, and I'll try to get good behind the scenes. Not saying it doesn't happen. I'm just saying it probably doesn't happen as frequently. Sure. And then I wonder, um, are they in terms of enforcement, who would be punished? Would it be the child or the parent? You know, um, I, I think probably when push comes to shove, it's probably on the parent um, because they're ultimately the guardian that's supposed to enforce those things. Um, but obviously, you know, if it's some 17 year old kid versus some 12 year old, that may probably come into play, too. But, um, you know, that's that's more, you know, making some assumptions along the way just because, uh, you know, this is a policy that just went into place, uh, you know, a couple, three months ago. So we still have to see how it would be implemented, uh, not just implemented, but but enacted. Uh, from an enforcement standpoint. Sure. And so are you, in your work, are you steering people away from certain investments or, you know, certain business activities because of the um, rule? You know, I, I think we have to look at it in, in a couple aspects of one that is still, a, I mean, it's still a large population of the world that cannot be, you know, just immediately turned off to say, hey, um, this market's limited and we just shouldn't care about it. Uh, you've got over a billion people there, so you can't ignore them um, over everything. Um, but, you know, whether any of the four sectors uh, that, that we do business in, I, I always, you know, sort of couch it going, you know, if you plan on working a lot with the Chinese or plan on Chinese guests 
uh, and those types of things coming, you need to sort of have a measured response off of that to say, you know, what does my business look like with those set of customers? And what does my business look like without that set of customers? Because if they don't come back and they aren't able to, to do things outside of China over the course of time, um, you know, that, that will be a factor and one that you need to consider out of the gate. You know, one thing that I will say, um, as we talk about travel and, and those types of things overall, um, you know, China currently has that zero tolerance policy as it relates to COVID and they will shut down cities and, and regions um, if there is any level of a spike to make sure that they, they eliminate that. Um, you know, if you were an area and, and dependent on esports customers coming from China or participating in your contest and those types of things, I wouldn't necessarily plan on those people coming back anytime soon. Um, part of that is going to be contingent. And I think that policy will remain in place at least until after the Olympics, uh, which are in February, um, because they want to make sure they have an exceptional um, event that they have there for the Winter Games in Beijing. Um, so I think they're going to try to keep things as compact and tight as they possibly can. Um, and I think then you'll see some loosening. But even then, you know, they, they've said uh, that they want to make sure that, you know, as it relates to a social balance, um, if there are areas where it could end up being harmful, uh, they'll restrict access. Now, esports and gaming does not just mean playing. It also means streaming. It means um, watching as well. Mm -hmm. And um, would the, do you know if the restriction uh, encompasses only playing or does it encompass streaming is, I mean, do you know anything about the nuances of the definition? You know, I, I, I think I, I take much more of a strict view on what they do and don't allow off of this uh, just because of that social uh, balance. So, uh, you know, I, I'm assuming at some point they probably start if you if you aren't playing uh, and you're not doing that, if all of a sudden you're watching Twitch a heck of a lot more um, or, or trying to over WeChat and other things, uh, you know, and their version of WeChat's 10 times different than the one we have and, and everything else uh, because they, they have so many more features off of that, that they're, it, I, I'm sure that something would come down to say, hey, we need you to focus on X and ignore Y type thing. I'd be shocked otherwise. You know, I've had a number of um, esports coaches and um, you know, gamer doc Psych Sensei appear on my show. And um, esports um, pro athletes have a little bit broader, um, at, you know, training than just playing. I, they work out, they do some other things. Maybe they could do visualization or do some other things that might fall outside of playing in order to, uh, you know, continue to improve. What do you think about that? You know, I, I think uh, first and foremost, you know, if you look at, um, and, and, and I can say this from a sports perspective, um, you know, esports programs today uh, have sometimes all the same benefits as any professional other sport out there, whether it's football, basketball, everything else in between. Um, it's about diet. It's about the mental aspects of sports. Um, it's about, you know, various practice regimens, everything else along the way. Um, and that's what you need to do to do it right. I always, I always joke with somebody, you know, I spent uh, a good portion of my early career uh, specifically working within college athletics. And I had one of our uh, team psychologists that was very involved with NASCAR. And I said, what do a bunch of guys that drive left for a living uh, need a team psychologist for? And, you know, he talked me through their whole aspect. I got the full tour, everything else. I'm like, okay, my ignorant statement, I apologize off of that. But back to your question as it relates to esports, you know, those are all very big components of those that train over everything. Um, and I think it goes into the segments off of that of if they see a talent to be able to do that, they're going to make sure that you have the resources to be able to do that at the best of your ability. Um, so they're going to allow, you know, the mental preparedness and, and, and mindset, um, as well as being able to work out, eat healthy and all of those things to make, you know, you in a good position to move forward. 
You know, and that, you know, that's very interesting because when you think about a lot of um, sports, like if you think about swimming, they're going to swim a massive amount, um, uh, quite a few hours a day in order to train. If you look at um, um, gym, gymnasts, they spend many hours in the day, you know, they'll spend out eight hours or more uh, training. But if you look at track athletes or you know there's some some athletes that have to minimize the number of hours that they actually um, do the actual sport so i wonder if it's kind of possible to be um at uh, you know to gain the skills needed or to be at some level if there's a reduction of hours played you know i i think it probably depends some on the athlete um, and what they what they need to make sure that works. And, and I look at that from the standpoint of, you know, the athletes I've worked with over the years, you have some that just have a tremendous talent that uh, is God given in every way. And you're like, I wish I could have half of that. And it just rolls and it's it's fluid and they don't have to work as hard. They have the metabolism, they have the mental aspects, all of those various things that matter. But to the same extent, you've got somebody that has the heart and soul and passion to be able to do it, and they got to work their tails off to get it done, you know, and those are the guys that, you know, and gals, I shouldn't say just guys, uh, the athletes out there um, that, you know, are like, hey, I've got to stay after her and, you know, be that track athlete that, you know, runs X amount more or that swimmer that needs to do, at, you know, X more laps or dive or, or whatever else and stay behind because they need that extra level of mental prep. They need that extra level of athletic prep uh, to be able to do that. So I think it's contingent upon the athlete more than anything. Um, but, you know, as I always say, in, in fact, I remember when I was working with somebody off of an athlete training center we were doing and they said, oh, we can instantaneously predict you know, looking genetically at who's an athlete and who's not. And I said, I'm going to contradict you every day that ends in why, because I've seen enough people over the time that put heart and soul into it. And sometimes the people that have a lot of this and a lot of this will surpass the ones that have the, the automatic talent. Absolutely. Um, do you, you know, do you think other countries might follow suit and adopt similar policies? You know, I really don't see anything off of that right now, looking at the geopolitical landscape. I mean, I, I shouldn't say that completely. Obviously, I think you have other uh, totalitarian regimes such as North Korea and that that probably can put those things into place uh, to be able to do that. Um, but I think for most of the rest of the world, um, you know, putting parameters off of that uh, just doesn't seem realistic. I mean, they may put little things in to tweak it. Um, but really sort of controlling what happens in someone's home, um, you know, at least from a United States perspective and, and, you know, European and other things along the way. And, and, and I would even say most Asia that's sort of like, hey, uh, we're not going to curtail it to the type that, that China did, um, you know, along the way. We may put some guidelines in to say, hey, we don't think your kids should play more than X hours a day, um, but they're not going to come down in, in a very meaningful way and say, hey, uh, you're limited to three hours a week and, and enjoy your time on weekends. Sure. And I think North Korea probably already has a um, uh, yeah. protocol in place. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, as I said that, I'm like, I can think of one regime for sure that's probably already there, but, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think I don't think they they uh, you know miss any regulation that they could possibly um, do. Um, yeah, well, and, and, uh, and I think I think to their neighbors, real quick, if I can just interject, yeah, you know, if sure. you look at like Japan and South Korea, obviously that have you know also strong, you know, uh, people that believe in esports and and have good programs, those countries aren't going to restrict that. You know, they just aren't. Sure, sure. Um, and, you know, gaming is a huge eco ecosystem and it impacts careers. And do you think that this restriction will also alter that ecosystem for China? Um, it could. You know, I think we have to see what happens with the larger geopolitical landscape of China and, and somewhat of its next steps. Um, I mean, some of the actions you're seeing are very much trying to go to a closed based society and sort of, you know, uh, centralize that power a little bit more um, while some of the rest of the world. And I think the thing we've learned over the last two years as we've been in the middle of this pandemic is how interconnected the world is. 
um, and the types of things that we rely on um, along the way. And, and obviously, China at this point holds a lot of those those strings to make everything work, whether it be supply chain or raw materials or, or other things along the way from a workforce standpoint. Um, so we have yet to see how that may or may not impact uh, not just their society, but but the global society as a whole. Are you able to um, say whether this um, policy is good or bad or is it somewhere in between? Um, from my perspective, it's not a good policy. I, I, I'm very much of a, a, a free market uh, you know, laissez-faire kind of guy uh, that believes in open societies to be able to, to do what they feel is best and, and let's get those talents out. So, you know, that's my own personal view off of that. Um, obviously, I think, uh, you know, uh, there's people in the Chinese government that have a different view than I do on life. So. Sir, and I have to echo that. I totally <laughs> agree with you. And I would say that it's bad. But yeah. anyway, yeah. That's fine. We, we can <laughs> we, we can have that uh, that opinion in the United States um, where we have a free market. So um, how can people find you if they're interested in um, your services? Well, you know, would love to talk to anything in, you know, any of the four sectors that we met, that, that I talked about earlier in gaming, entertainment, sports and hospitality. Um, go to our website, which is globalmarketadvisors.com. Um, or you can also reach out to me directly on my email. Um, which is bdb at globalmarketadvisors.com as well. Terrific. Well, I really appreciate you being on the show, Brendan. We've learned so much about China's policy. Thank you for having me, and uh, I'd be welcome to come back anytime. This is a great program. Terrific. All right. Thank you to our viewers for joining us today. Make sure you tune, tune in next week. My guest will be Ben Bueno of Beacons GG. See you then. Mm -hmm.